seated. As we were singing the songs earlier about uh, the Creed and the Apostles' Creed and saying the Apostles' Creed, and uh, you know, it sounds like a very churchy thing to do, right? To talk about creeds and what you believe. <clears throat> and yet, there is a TV show that talks about creeds, right? And, uh, and it talks about the, uh, the way, this is the, this, is the, you know, this is the way we do things. And, and, and <clears throat> perhaps you recognize this next figure. Uh, if you've ever watched The Mandalorian, you would real recognize that uh, he lived by a creed too. He's a fictional TV character in the Star Wars universe. Uh, the Mandalorian, and as you get into the series, you realize that he's not the only one. There's a whole uh, group of these Mandalorians, and then you find out that from a planet, Mandalore, that was previously destroyed in a, in a, a war, and so they're on the in hiding mostly. But this guy is a an amazing warrior that always seems to survive amazing situations. <coughs> but the reason I bring him up is because there was a little phrase that when they get together and they would talk about it and they'd say, you know, they'd say, well, this is the way. And they'd all respond, yes, this is the way. And they'd all chant it together. This is the way that it is. It's like we have this creed, we have our rules, and we live by those rules. Even if there's, and many of them to me, uh, seem pretty crazy, like he can't take his helmet off, you know, can't reveal his face. Well, that's part of the Mandalorian creed. And they would say that, and they'd all say, this is the way. This is the way. You know, the earlier, early followers of Jesus, um, do you remember what they were called? Some people say, well, Christians, right? That's what you call Jesus' followers. But in the Bible, the word, they were only called Christians three times. Christians. They were called disciples 269 times. You say, okay, but then what do you call this group of disciples? You just call them disciples of Jesus or followers, disciples of follower, learner of Jesus. Followers of Jesus then would be maybe the, the way to, to describe it. Well, how, did they, how do you refer to, how did they refer to back in those days? And, and there's an interesting term that seemed to be common amongst the early church followers. And, and we hear about it, and uh, that the early followers were part of a movement called The Way. A and they would say, um, we're part of The Way. Let me just show you a few examples. For example, in, in Acts chapter 9 and verse 2, uh, Paul, uh, before he was called Paul, he was Saul, before he was a follower of Christ, Saul, in Acts 9, uh, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus, so that if he found any there who belonged to The Way, See that group, the, the way, whether uh, men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. So they were trying to stomp out this new movement called the way, this group of Christians. And they were called the way. Uh, another example in Acts 19 it says about that time uh, there arose a great disturbance about the way. So the way was, the, this group was causing some waves, some disturbance because of the you know, they're teaching about Jesus and, and that he is the Messiah. And amongst the Jewish context they were in, that would create some waves. But notice that they were called the way. A another example in Acts 24, verse 14, Paul says, However, I admit that I worship the God of our ancestors as a follower of the way. You say, well, why did they call the early Christians the way? What was it about that? Uh, the, the, why would they call them the way? Some have suggested that maybe it was inspired by Jesus who said, I am the way, right? The truth and the life. I am I'm the way. And, and so perhaps uh, picking up on that, his followers simply said, let's call this movement the way. The way to God. The way to be a Christian. The way we should live. Right? The way. Now, now, this leads to the second point I want to make. And that is that believing in Jesus' name is how you become a Christian. Following in Jesus' way is how you be a Christian. 
Now think about that a moment. Let me read it again. Believing in Jesus' name is how you become a Christian. Right? You, you put your faith in Jesus who died on a cross that we celebrated earlier. Right? That you believe in what he did, that he is the son of God that came into this world. And you believe that, and, and by faith you become a Christian. However, when we follow, it's following in Jesus' way right, is how you be a Christian. And some people believe that those can be separate. But I don't think in Jesus' minds they were. I believe that, that believing in and following and living, you know, becoming a Christian and being a Christian were never supposed to be divorced. They go together. It's a package deal. John Mark uh, Comer wrote a book uh, a little while ago. It's a best-selling book right now, and actually it's kind of what's inspired this series as I read it I, and some of the thoughts. And this is what he says. He says, I have come to believe that there is a way of life laid down by Jesus himself and that if we give ourselves to it and ultimately to him, it will lead to the life we all most truly crave. There's something about following Jesus that brings purpose and meaning to life. What Jesus would say is, if you adopt my overall way of life, if you adopt the way that I live, you can experience the life that I have for you, the abundant life that Jesus talked about. In our mission, our vision statement <clears throat> at our church here, this is the way we worded it, that we are a community of ordinary, regular, everyday people, right? But there's something about us that we're striving for, we're dreaming to be. And that, we want to live that extraordinary life that, that Christ talked about. Walking with Him. Imagine following Jesus in a way that just brought a, a, a whole different level of joy and peace and purpose and meaning in life. The extraordinary life with Christ. We aspire to it because when we live that way, it becomes attractive to our world. <clears throat> now, to understand this a little more, I want to go back and talk about the Jewish educational system because this is the, the way Jesus trained his earlier followers. And, and it was the way that the Jewish people did it back in 2,000 years ago. So let me just give you a really brief, I'll do it quick, so as not to bore you, but when the educational, in the Jewish world, there were three levels of education. Generally, under the age of 12, was called Bet Sefer, and this was primarily teachings about the Torah, as they learned the Torah would be the first five books of the Old Testament, the books of Moses, and that would become their textbook, primarily in those years, in their religious training. <clears throat> and as they would hit their teenage years, some of them would, that would be the end of their schooling. Um, I mean, they would maybe go down to the local synagogue and continue on, but their formal training was then moved on into, into different uh, trades and, uh, or having families or whatever over those next years. And um, so the Bet Talmud was this second phase. Uh, and, and in the, that age, they would look at the whole Old Testament, right? So uh, all the rest of the books in the Old Testament. And then the third phase, and this, this phase, if people really excelled, they, they memorized probably the whole first five books of the Bible. In fact, many of them would even memorize the whole Old Testament, if you can imagine. A and those who really excelled in their religious studies would then go on to apprentice under a rabbi. And uh, these were, these, this would be like, and you, were, you couldn't just desire to go off to university or college. You know, you had to be selected and chosen by the rabbis who would see you. And so they would say, come and follow me and apprentice under me. And so the best of the best were chosen and the rest would, rec you know, go into regular family life and, and uh, working their, in their trades and their jobs. But those ones who were chosen to go on would be um, kind of the best of the best. And, and they would apprentice under, the ra under a rabbi. And so that was kind of the mentality. It was like, kind of like an Ivy League training, like the top of the, 
the, the, the educational system. And so this is why it's surprising and, and maybe uh, revolutionary. When Jesus came along, who was, who had, who was a rabbi and had extreme, an incredible handle on the Old Testament, New Testament, and, and he made this statement, come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. When Jesus, when Jesus spoke those words, as a rabbi, come follow me, that was like an invitation of a lifetime. Maybe the most extraordinary thing you would hear. This is what some people w would see, like this was like winning the jackpot. You know, and, and Jesus is calling them to come and, and invest their lives in people. Uh, you've been designed for many different skills. And, and there's maybe some people you'll design, or, or, you know, are writing computer code. Others are making widgets or selling burgers. And, but Jesus comes along and says, I want you to come and follow me and invest in people, fish for people. Well, and it says, surprisingly, in the next verse, it says, at once, at once, they didn't even think twice about it. At once they left their nets and followed him. And I thought about that. That's, that's pretty surprising, isn't it? I mean, just to walk away from your career and come follow Jesus. And yet when you, you understand the educational system, you realize this was their chance. And, and so they left immediately. Uh, and then another instance, uh, the next verse says, going on from there, he saw, Jesus saw two other brothers, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother, John, and, and they were in a boat uh, with their father, Zebedee, preparing their nets. And Jesus called them, and immediately, <laughs> immediately it says, like right away, they left their boats and their father and followed him. This, As I said, this was, for them, this was an opportunity. They said, wow, a, a rabbi, in fact, an up-and-coming rabbi, is asking me to come and join him? This is usually only the select few, the best of the best. And he wants me. Like, no wonder they dropped immediately what they were doing. And then, then it says, uh, a little later on in chapter 9, it says, Jesus, as he went on from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at a tax collector's booth. He says, follow me, he told him. And Matthew got up and followed him because it was a privilege. Rumors were going that this rabbi was maybe the Messiah, the one who had been talked about for thousands of years and prophesied about. Could it be? Could this be the one? And if he asks you to follow, this is the opportunity that they would not let go. Th they jumped at this opportunity to follow him and apprentice with Jesus. Now, the goal of apprenticing, the goal of apprenticing is to become like your teacher. It's, it's about being with Jesus, becoming like Jesus, and doing what Jesus did. And the reason I use the word apprentice in discipleship is probably because apprenticing is probably the best English word we have to describe what discipling is. It's really about apprenticing. It's, and to apprentice means it's not just an intellectual thing or where we attend a class, but it's being there, watching, becoming like, and doing what the teacher did. There was an old saying amongst the Jewish rabbis, that you would want to get covered in the dust of your rabbi, which meant as you walked along the dusty roads together, you were so close that the, they were kicking up dust on you. It's like that's where you were going to be if you were apprenticing with your teacher. You had to stay close, to be with them. So Jesus invited these disciples to come and follow him. And then he taught them. But not just them, he taught the crowds. Uh, one of his most famous sermons, the Sermon on the Mount, is uh, recorded in Matthew 5, 6, and 7. And in that, Jesus described his way of life. He used the language of the kingdom of heaven often is like. And he uses something, he said, often in there, he says, you have heard it said this way, but I say to you. In other words, he's, 
He's saying, this is, the, this is what the religious way you've always been taught, but I'm going to do something. I want to teach you something revolutionary, something counterculture, something different. I want to teach you a different way. My way versus religious, religious way. So uh, here's a summary. The next slide gives you a summary of the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, he starts off by talking about, we often call it the Beatitudes or the blessed way of living. Blessed are the meek, blessed are the uh, pure in heart. And then he, he lists all these blessed, uh, fortunate, or, or happy, joyful, joy-filled. This is the way to live. And he describes that right up front. And then he gets into a challenge. He says, you can have maximum impact by being salt and light in the world. Uh, that's, that's the way I want you to live. There is a way of, be, of impacting the world, of salt and light. Well, how do you do that? And then he gets into some specifics. And he describes his way versus the religious way. He'll say things like, well, you've heard it said, do not murder. But I say to you, don't even harbor anger in your heart because you're committing murder in your heart towards somebody. God knows your heart. So be careful to guard your heart. Right? So this, he says, this is what you've been taught. This is kind of the religious way. But, and Jesus raises the bar and says, this is my way. And then he, he mentioned adultery. He'll say, you've heard it said, do not commit adultery. But I say, don't even look at a woman lustfully. Or he'll, another one he said, um, uh, an eye for an eye. You've heard it said, an eye for an eye. Take revenge. If someone takes gouge out your eye, you know, gouge out theirs. An eye for eye. I tell you, turn the other cheek. I have a different way of living. He then say, you've heard it said, love your, your, you know, your friends and hate your enemies. Well, I say, love your enemies. I have a different way. And when you, when you go to give to the needy, don't announce it in front of everybody so they cheer you on. Do it in secret. That's my way. And when you pray, do it in private. Go into a room, close the door. My way is just you meeting with the Father. That's, that's when you know you're, where your heart's really at. Or, or store up, he said, talks about storing up treasure. He says the, the world's way is to store up treasure on earth. But he says, Store up treasure in heaven. That's my way. And he goes on describing his way compared to the way everybody else was thinking. It was counterculture, counterintuitive. And then he comes to a summary statement towards the end. And he, and he talks about um, this, this uh, the, the way to live. He, he calls it, the, he doesn't call it the golden rule. We've called it the golden rule. And that is, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. In other words, treat other people the way you want to be treated. It's kind of a summary statement for his way. If, if, if you're not sure in a situation, then just think, how would I like to be treated? And then treat others that way. And then to wrap up his sermon, he gives uh, three images. And the first image is uh, the image of two pathways. The second one is two trees, and the third one is two builders. And these images are all meant to challenge or to bring the point home and saying, are you willing to follow my way? For example, the first one, the two paths, let me read it to you. He says this in Matthew 7, 13 to 14. He says, enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the road or, or path or, or way, you could translate that, that lead, in fact, that's the Greek word for road here, is the same Greek word used in Acts when it talks about followers of the way. It's the same word. This is the way. This is the road that leads to destruction. And many enter through it, but small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life. And only a few find it. What Jesus is saying here is there is a way to live, but most people don't live that way. I want you to think about a different way that leads to life. And then he talks about two trees, the next analogy. And the two trees, he talks about, uh, take a look at their fruit, he says, because some is producing good fruit and some bad fruit. You can tell their way, their, their, their from their behavior, you can tell from their fruit whether it's a good way, to, a good path to follow or not. 
And then the third analogy he uses is about two builders. One who builds a house on sand, another builds it on the rock. And he says, don't build your house on the sand because when the storms come, your house will crumble and fall. Build it on a strong foundation. Build on the rock. And, and then Jesus says this in, in Matthew 7. He says, therefore, if anyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice, he is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And how do you build your house on the rock? By putting into practice, by doing the things that I've told you to do. By following my way. By following the Jesus way. And so the bottom line here is then, then we need to practice this way. How do you practice the way of Jesus? Jesus. This week I uh, was flipping through uh, YouTube and, and I came across some pretty amazing feats. You, no doubt people will put these little reels on, Facebook, YouTube, TikTok, I guess. But there are people who put these little videos out there of doing some amazing things. I saw this woman, she was running along the beach with this little, I guess it's called a skimboard, and she runs along the beach, throws it out in the water, then runs and lands on it just as a wave hits. Uh, and this is obviously uh, uh, in, in, the, in the ocean. And she skims along the wave as it's crashing all along the beach. And then way down the beach, she comes back into shore. And it's like, wow, that's pretty cool. She makes it look so easy. But it clearly is not. It took a lot of practice to do that. I watched another woman who was standing. It looked like a paint can. It was like a cylinder with a board on top. And she was standing on it. How hard is that? Then somebody took a corn, like a, a, an ear of corn, and set it down on the board at the end of the board. She flipped it up, stomped on the board, it flipped it up and caught it in her, on her head, standing on this cylinder. And I think, how many times would you, how hard is it to stand on a cylinder, let alone flip a corn, uh, an, ear, uh, an ear of corn up and catch it on your head? Like, like that would be, it, but it takes a lot of training. And people train and and practice things over and over so they become good at it and they get noticed. So they can go viral and maybe make a few dollars or become noticed, become famous or whatever, whatever they do it. But it takes a lot of practice, doesn't it? And Jesus is saying, that's what I want you to do. I want you to practice this way of life because it's not easy. It's not the normal way of thinking, of doing things. It's the Jesus way. And, and I want, in order to do that, we have to do the three things I mentioned earlier. We have to, to be with Jesus. We have to become like Him. And we have to do as Jesus did. To apprentice with Him. And you say, well, that's fine, but uh, that, was, that was the disciples. He invited 12 disciples. Well, what about me? Oh, no, He didn't just invite 12 disciples. He clearly invited everybody. Look, Look at uh, Luke 9, verse 23. Whoever wants to be my disciple. What does whoever mean? I checked it out in the Greek. You know what it means? It means whoever. <laughs> Hello? That means you. That means me. It means anybody. Whoever wants to be my disciple. His, his extension was to everybody. And Jesus extended that to a tax collector, a sex worker, a blind beggar, a betrayer even. Someone who would betray him. He, he called them to come to him. You know, there's a risk that Jesus took when he invited everybody because he knew people would reject him and nobody likes to be rejected. That's why typically rabbis would hand pick they wouldn't just throw a blanket invitation come and follow me only jesus did that no most rabbis would hand pick the best of the best and say come be my disciple not jesus he didn't mind it broke his heart but if people would reject him his pride that was not an issue 
he was humble enough to accept that. But he was going to throw out the invitation to whoever, whoever wants to apprentice with me, I'm open to it. He invites us in. You know, in, uh, in the New Testament, we often see this, this crowd of people and then we see the committed uh, apprentices of Jesus, like these two groups throughout, in, uh, throughout the Bible. And uh, Jesus would often, often talk about the crowds who were there, who were curious, they were listening in, but they were just kicking the tires, not sure if they were going to believe. Some of them, many did, and, and became followers, uh, but many didn't, and some, some rejected. But the invitation went to everybody. And so the question goes out to you this morning, well, where do you stand? What crowd are you in? Are you in the curious crowd, a part of that group? I, I'm kind of interested in this, but, you know, I'm not sure, but I believe it all. You know, Jesus would say, that's okay, that's a great place to start, but stay curious. And then there are those that were apprenticing, who were learning, who were drawing as close as they could to Jesus because they wanted to be like him and do what Jesus did. And they were willing to practice the way. And so that's my ch challenge to you this morning. As we start into this series, we're going to spend a couple more weeks on this before we get to Easter. But is this idea, well, let's then practice the way of Jesus. Let's get close to him. Let's take a look at what he did. And, and let's do what Jesus did. Let's become like him. And that takes practice. And it's more than just an hour on Sunday morning. But take time to be with him and practice the way. We'll talk more about this in the next few weeks, but just let's go to prayer now. Our Father in heaven, I thank you for this, uh, this idea that we have that Jesus had so much more in store for us than just that we would believe in him. But he wanted us to follow him also. And to become like him. And Lord, as we, uh, as we get a better handle on this, Lord, I just pray you would uh, speak into our hearts and our lives and, and, and help us to if necessary, change some things. I just pray that your heart would, uh, your Holy Spirit would speak to our lives and, and put the finger on things that, that need to go in our lives. Maybe something this morning about the Jesus way that we realize we're not doing. Lord, I just pray that um, you would use that as we choose to follow you, that we would follow your ways. Lord, just uh, show us uh, the way forward and, and be near us. In the name of Jesus we pray, amen.